Hi, Ridgecrest readers. This is Mrs. Wheeler, and I'm excited to kick off our new book, Ranger in Time by Kate Messner. This book is about a time-traveling golden retriever. So it's my favorite genre. I thought I'd read it from my library. My students know that I love to read. And this is my favorite kind of book, historical fiction. So some of the characters are made up fictional, but the events in this story really did happen, most of the events. So read along with me. I'm going to read chapters one and chapter two. Chapter one is called Stowaway, November 29th, 1910. Jack Nin packed the wooden crate with potatoes and cabbages. He loaded it into a cart and hitched up his horse, We Too. Then they started up the path along the New Zealand coast. It's a short journey to Port Chalmers. There we will sell our goods to the polar explorers, Jack said. They will leave for the South Pole with Nin family vegetables in the ship's hold. We too gave a whinny. Jack leaned forward and stroked the star-shaped patch between the horse's eyes. The name We Too meant star in Maori, the language of Jack's mother. But Jack and his brothers rarely spoke that language aloud. They didn't speak Chinese outside of the house either. Jack's father had insisted on English. Being half Maori and half Chinese already brought enough trouble. Jack's father had died a year ago. Now his mother struggled to run the family's market garden with her four boys. They sold their potatoes, cabbages, tomatoes, and onions to the Chinese greengrocers in Dunedin. But the Nins were struggling. Some people in New Zealand said that Chinese men like Jack's father had stolen their jobs. They urged their neighbors not to do business with Chinese market gardeners. Jack hoped the explorers would buy the vegetables he'd brought. Every little bit helped. When Jack arrived at the harbor, a big ship was tied to the dogs. docks. Dogs yapped and howled. Men loaded sacks of coal and tugged ponies into stalls on the deck. Excuse me, Jack called to a man carrying a sack over his shoulder. Are you from the ship? I am, the man said. He had brown hair and a stubble of beard. Might you purchase goods for your journey? My family has the finest vegetables you'll find in Dunedin. Jack pulled a folded up piece of paper from his pocket. He had made a sign for the Nin Market Garden with drawings to show all of the vegetables. Sketching felt like magic to Jack. He loved filling blank paper with objects that looked real enough to touch. Perhaps some potatoes or cabbages, Jack said. The man laughed. We're headed to Antarctica, my friend. It's a five week voyage to the continent and who knows how many more before we reach the South Pole. Fresh vegetables won't keep. We need our space for biscuits and pemmican, dried beef and fat that'll last far longer than your cabbages. Of course, Jack said. How foolish he was not to realize that. But, the man went on. His eyes had a lively sparkle as he shifted the sack to his other shoulder. We may be interested in some of your goods for a feast before we depart. Wait here. The man carried his load to the ship and returned with some money. Jack unloaded his crate from the horse cart and accepted the coins. Thank you, he said. He knew he should start for home. There was work to be done, but he couldn't stop staring at the tall masted ship. This is over a hundred years ago that this story takes place, 1910. It buzzed with activity and adventure. You think you'll reach the pole? I'm sure of it, the man grinned. You'll see my name in the newspaper when we return. Apsley Cherry Gerard, right along with the famous Captain Scott. Jack imagined what it would be like to travel to a place no one had ever seen. It made him think of his grandfather, who'd come to New Zealand to work in the Otago gold mines as a young man so he could send money to his family in China. Jack wished he could help his mother that way, but the mines had been cleared of their gold long ago. Jack looked at the big ship and wondered if there might be another way to help. Do you need more workers? 
he asked. The man shook his head. Thousands came forward when Captain Scott put out his call for workers. I was lucky to be chosen myself. The man looked back at the ship. When we depart, we'll be a crew of 65 men, along with 33 dogs and 19 ponies to pull the sleds. I see. Thank you, then. Jack turned back to his horse. He couldn't stop thinking about his grandfather's courage, setting off for a new land to help his family. And he couldn't stop thinking about his own Wana'u. Wana'u is family in Maori, but it was more than Jack's mother and brothers. It was his extended family and the spirits of his ancestors. Jack had a responsibility to all of them. What if he snuck onto the ship and hid until it was far from port? He could show Captain Scott and the others what a strong worker he was. Surely they would accept him as a cabin boy. Then he could earn money for his family. His brothers could manage the market garden without him for a time. And while he was gone, his mother would have one less mouth to feed. He would return home in a few weeks or months, perhaps. Jack didn't know how long it might take to get to the South Pole after they reached land. But the longer he soaked up the excitement at the harbor, the more he wanted to go. Jack searched the crowd until he spotted a familiar face. Pack, Kiung, Jack called. The boy was a little younger than Jack, the son of one of the greengrocers who did business with the Nim family. So he and Jack had become friends. Jack took a coin from his pocket and held it up. I have a job that I must do. Will you take we two home for me? Tell my mother I am going on a trip to earn money that will help our family. Do you guys think he's going to stow away, hide on the boat and go with them? The South Pole is way at the bottom of the whole earth. If you look at a globe, it's that really icy part way at the bottom, the South Pole. Nobody had ever been there before this. The boy agreed, accepted the coin, and took We Two's reins. Give these to my mother, Jack said, and handed the boy the rest of the coins. Tell her there will be more when I return. Then Jack headed for the pile of coal sacks being loaded onto the boat. He hoisted one over his shoulder. It was heavy, but Jack was strong from hauling vegetables. He went straight to the boat as if he'd been hired to carry coal like the other men. But when Jack tossed the sack onto the deck, he didn't return to shore. He slipped past the coal sacks to the pony stalls. When no one was watching, he ducked behind a crate of horse feed. Jack crouched low and still. He waited for what must have been more than an hour. His legs cramped. Every time someone walked by, his heart jumped into his throat. Finally, the ship's great horn gave a blast. Jack peered out from behind the crate. The explorers kissed their wives goodbye and waved them back to shore. The band played, the crowd cheered, and the Terra Nova pulled away from the dock. He did stow away. Okay, chapter two is called Snowballs and Squirrels, and this is moving in time. So this takes place at the present day. Ranger, catch! This is Ranger, time traveling dog. Luke packed a big snowball and tossed it high over the yard. Ranger bounded through the new snow, leaped into the air and caught it in his teeth. He chomped down and the snowball exploded in pieces. Some of them stuck in Ranger's fur. Ranger has a beard, Sadie laughed. You look like grandpa, she said, and brushed the fluffy white snow off Ranger's chin with her mitten. Just then, Ranger caught a scent. <gasps> squirrel! Think about what your dogs do if they smell a squirrel. There it was, underneath Mom's bird feeder. Ranger took off running, but the squirrel raced through the snow and up a tree. Ranger barked up at it. Luke laughed. Poor Ranger, missed another one. Ranger loved chasing squirrels more than almost anything. They were the reason he failed his test to become a search and rescue dog. 
even though he'd done all of the training. To be a search and rescue dog, you had to ignore squirrels, even when they were right there, giving off their wonderful, swishy-tailed smells right under your nose. Ranger chased them every time. If a real person needed help, he knew he'd be able to follow directions, but that wasn't good enough for the search and rescue trainers, so Ranger didn't get to go on any real searches. He'd had lots of practice searching and rescuing though. He'd searched for people in the muggy woods of summer and sniffed out people in the slush and ice of winter. Ranger could find a scent even when the person was buried in snow. Sometimes his paws got icy during winter training. Ranger liked summer searches better. I'm getting cold, Luke said. Want to go in for some hot cocoa? And cookies, Sadie said. I'll race you to the house. Ranger didn't drink cocoa, but he was ready to go inside. Also, he loved the cookie pieces that Sadie slipped him under the kitchen table. So Ranger raced too. His paws sank deep in the new snow, but he stayed by Luke's side all the way to the door. When Luke opened it, the warm air smelled like chocolate. Luke and Sadie's mom set a plate of oatmeal cookies on the table. Ready for a snack? She said. Luke and Sadie changed out of their snow pants in the mud room while Ranger got a drink from his water dish. He was just about to follow them to the kitchen when he heard a humming sound coming from his dog bed. Ranger went to his bed and pawed his blanket out of the way. Beneath it, he found the antique first aid kit he had dug up in the family garden. The old metal box had made this sound before. Once, it happened when a boy named Sam and his family needed Ranger's help on a long journey. Another time, the box hummed when a boy named Marcus was in trouble in a big arena far away. And it had also made the sound when a girl named Sarah was about to leave on a long, dangerous trip. And there's other books about his adventures that you can read. Ranger had helped those children and brought back treasures from his time away. He kept them tucked under the blanket in his dog bed. There was a quilt square Sam had given Ranger when they said goodbye. A strange long leaf from the boy in the arena and a soft feather from the Sarah girl. Beside those things sat the old metal first aid kit. And now the box was humming again. Ranger nuzzled its worn leather strap over his neck. The humming grew louder and the box warmed at his throat. At first, Ranger could still hear the sounds of hot chocolate mugs clinking in the kitchen, but soon the noise from the box was so loud that it drowned out everything else. Light began to spill from the cracks in the box. White, hot light. It was so bright that Ranger had to close his eyes. When he opened them, it was raining. Do you think he just traveled? It wasn't home rain, like the kind Ranger watched from the porch swing with Luke and Sadie. This rain was wild, blowing, and the floor under Ranger's paws was moving, lurching back and forth so much he could hardly stand. I wonder how the ground could be moving like that. Let's see where he's at now. The hot chocolate smell from the kitchen was gone. The air here smelled of salt and sea and wind. It smelled of wooden crates, wet animals, and men. It smelled of panic. Strap down the fuel, a man shouted. Lower the topsails, someone else hollered. I can help, called a boy as he hurried over the deck. Ranger caught his scent, a mix of sweat, horses, and hay. Watch out! screamed a man, and a big sack tumbled down from the heap on the deck. It washed across the deck on a sloshing wave and flew toward Ranger. He jumped out of the way just in time, but the sack knocked the boy's feet out from under him. Ranger barked. The boy cried out and disappeared over the side of the boat. And that is the end of chapter two. Who do you think that boy was? What do you think Ranger's gonna do? Do you think he's gonna help him? Where is Ranger? Has he gone back in time? 
tomorrow we'll read chapters three and four.